In this video, we're going to talk about SNES emulation in the Xbox Series X and S versions of RetroArch. The first time I covered Super Nintendo emulation on the channel for Xbox Series X and S, the original version of BSNES was not supported. In the months and updates since, BSNES does now work on Xbox, and it will always be my go-to for Super Nintendo emulation. So let's go ahead and dive in. Now before we begin, this guide is a continuation of my how to install RetroArch guide. Now our one and only prerequisite for SNES emulation on the Xbox Series X and S is to get SNES games. There are a number of ways to get these. If you have a hacked Wii or Wii U, you could dump virtual console games. If you have a huge physical collection, you can use a hardware dumper like the Retro 2. Or you can hack a Retron 5 to dump SNES games. That's what I did with my collection. It was actually pretty funny. Or, of course, you can resort to the shady parts of the net, but as always, do not be asking me for download links. That's illegal. I'm not going to risk my channel for your piracy tendencies. Anyway, once you have your SNES games sourced, we just need to add them to our Xbox Series X and S, either through the internal SSD or the use of a USB drive. If you want to go the USB route, just put your USB drive in and then just drag your SNES games right into it. Now back over on the Xbox, put that USB drive into it if you're using that method, and just get booted into RetroArch. And now we're ready to begin loading up Super Nintendo games. So one of the methods to do so, go down to load content, and navigate to the directory that you have your Super Nintendo games stored in. So if you have USB, it should be in the E drive, SNES games, select a game, choose a core, and it will run. Or if you put them on the S drive, which is the uh, development files file share, you go into S, Program Files, Windows Apps, RetroArch Folder, Games Folder, Super Nintendo Games, and the same deal. I don't really care for this method, it's a little bit slow, so what I like to do instead is make a games playlist. So I like to go into Manual Scan, choose my content directory, so I'm going to run my SNES games from the USB drive. So I would choose E, Super Nintendo, and scan this directory. If you want to run from the S drive, you would just need to go into your S drive, Program Files, Windows Apps, RetroArch Games folder, Games, Super Nintendo Games, and then tell it to scan that directory. Next, system name. Press right on your D-pad to go down to Nintendo and find Super Nintendo Entertainment System. Now for our default core, we're going to press right on the D-pad again and go down to Nintendo and we're going to find BSNES. Now make sure Scan Recursively is turned on if you have your games separated into subfolders, and make sure that you have Scan Inside Archives turned on if you have your games in zip format. And then once that's set, start the scan. And once that scan's finished, you'll have a new Super Nintendo playlist here on the bottom left. And then to play a game, all you need to do is go down to it, press A on it, and tell it to run. And there we go, Super Nintendo games up and running on the Xbox Series X and S version of RetroArch. So for those of you looking to get Super Nintendo games up and running on the Xbox Series X and S version of RetroArch, that's really all there is to it. It's pretty straightforward emulation core, thankfully. So it shouldn't be too long before you're up and running your favorite Super Nintendo games in amazing, accurate quality. But now let's go ahead and talk about some of the core options available to us within BSNES. So if you go into your RetroArch Quick Menu and scroll down to Options, our first option is Aspect Ratio, and this is set to Auto by default. You can choose between the SNES's native 8x7 output, or you can choose 4x3, NTSC, or PAL. I like to choose 4x3 personally because displays of the era would try to stretch games to fill the 4x3 frame. Next up we have Blur Emulation, so this is an accuracy setting. So you can choose to turn this on or off. I like to turn it on for accuracy's sake. Next up we have Entropy. This is set to low by default and you can just leave it here. Next up is a hot fixes option and this is an interesting one. It actually fixes games that would lock up on real hardware under certain situations. So for the most part you won't really need to mess with it, but the option is here if you have one of those known games. Next up is CPU overclocking. This is set to default at 100. So if you have games that have hardware based lag, you can increase the CPU speed to try to overcome that, or decrease the speed if you so choose. 
Next up, we have CPU Fast Math, and this is useful if you have a bunch of older Super Nintendo homebrew software. So if you do Super Nintendo homebrew, turn this option on, otherwise you probably might not need it. Next, we have a couple of special chip overclocking options. The first one is the SA1 coprocessor overclocking, so if you have SA1 games that are running a little bit slow, you can overclock that here. Or you can overclock the Super FX coprocessor to increase the speed in games like Star Fox. Next up, PPU Fast Mode, leave this on, and PPU Deinterlacing, leave this one on. Our next option is to remove the sprite limit on Super Nintendo games. So when there were too many sprites on a single scan line, you would get flickering. So any of you that played older 16, 8 -bit game, 16 and 8-bit games know what this looks like, so you can enable this option to try to remove it. Next up, no VRAM blocking. This is useful for older fan translations of Super Nintendo games. Just due to the nature of Super Nintendo emulation and how far it came in the last 20 years, a lot of older translations like relied on hacks and stuff, so this, this option will let you use them. Next up, show overscan. This will display the overscan area of your games. So, personal preference if you want this on or off. Next up, we have a number of Mode 7 HD options. The first one is Mode 7 HD Scale, so at 1x it is native resolution, and you can increase this all the way up to 8x. Now, depending on the game and the scale you choose, you might encounter some lag. It just really depends on if you're running on a Series X or a Series S, and the game at question. So, Super Mario Kart here is running perfectly fine at an 8x scale, but again, this might not be the case for every game. The next option is HD Mode 7 Perspective Correction. So for anyone that experiments with PS1 emulation, you should be familiar with this option. It makes it so the textures look right no matter what angle you're viewing them from. Next up we have Super Sampling. I'm not really a fan of the way Super Sampling is implemented in the BSNES core at this time, so I really don't recommend using it a whole lot. As you can see, it just kind of gets rid of the nice upscaled look of HD Mode 7. So it's like at that point you might as well just stick with native. Kind of gives it the same impression in my mind, so I'm not a big fan of it. Next up, HD Mode 7, HD to SD Mosaic. Go ahead and leave that on. DSP Fast Mode, leave that on. Next, DSP Cubic Interpolation. You can turn this on if you want to adjust the sound processing a little bit. Personal preference on this one, I just leave it off myself. Next up, we have DSP Echo Shadow RAM, and this is useful for older Super Mario World ROM hacks. So if you play older Super Mario World ROM hacks, you will want to turn this setting on. Otherwise, it's pretty safe to leave this one off. Next up, coprocessor delayed sync, you can leave this on, and then coprocessor prefer HLE, leave that one on, otherwise you have to have a BIOS file for every single coprocessor, and what a pain in the butt that used to be. We don't need that anymore. Hooray. Next up, we have preferred Super Game Boy BIOS. I'm not going to cover Super Game Boy emulation within BSNES at this time, I prefer to just use Same Boy these days to get the borders. Next up, we have amounts of frames to run ahead. This is to help reduce input latency, so you can run the emulation up to four frames ahead. It will introduce a little bit more lag to have run ahead on, so just be aware of that. But it does help drop the input latency, so it's pretty nice. Next up, enable touchscreen light gun. We're not going to really need to worry about this or super scope stuff because we don't really have any light gun options on the Xbox Series X version of RetroArch at the moment. But that's going to cover it as far as core options are concerned within the BSNES core. Core options you need to have set for certain games but not others. You can go into manage core options and save them as a game option file. But that's going to do it for BSNES emulation on the Xbox Series X and S version of RetroArch. As always, if you happen to have any questions, feel free to ask me down in the comment section below and I will do my best to try to help you out. But now if you could all do me a huge favor and please be sure to hit that like or dislike button just depending on how much you like today's tutorial. And if you haven't done so already, be sure to hit that sub button so you can see when new videos go live on the channel. Goes a long way to helping us keep the place growing and hitting our goals, and we're super grateful to all of you for that. If you'd like to further help support the channel, you can also check out that join button here on YouTube or the Patreon link in the bottom right hand corner of the screen. A little really goes a long way to keeping us up and running, so just big thank you to all of our current champions who have done so. You are all our rock stars. We appreciate you all so much for helping us keep going. But that's going to do it for this one, so until next time, my wonderful internet peeps, stay awesome, and we will see you all back next video.